أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله إن الحمد لله نحمله ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فهو المهتد ومن يدل الله فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا إنه أصلك الكلام كلام الله إلى حدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإنما الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة في البدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد وقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في القرآن الكريم بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا وقال الله سبحانه وتعالى أيضا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في حديثه إن في الجسد مضغة فإذا صلحت صلح الجسد كله فإذا فسدت فسدت جسد كله ألا وهي قلب أو كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم سبح اسم ربك الأعلى الذي خلق فسوى والذي قدر فهدى والذي أخرج المرعى أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters in Islam We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Who is deserving of all praises We send our thanks, our shukur to him And we send our salam and salutations Upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Upon his family his household, his companions, and all those who follow him in righteousness until the end of time. My dear brothers and sisters, by the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're all here to be reminded of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the matter that we'll be reminded of today is one that is integral and important to every single Muslim. As in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in which he said, in the, in the body, there's a lump of flesh. There's a lump of flesh, if it is good, if it is healthy, then the entire body is healthy. The entire body is good. And if it is bad, if it is unhealthy, if it is contaminated, then so is the entire body. Allah wa hiya qalb. That is the heart. This is the heart. The point I'd like for us to be reminded about today is about the sicknesses of the heart. Because if we want to purify our heart and maintain a healthy heart, we must, find, we must first be reminded of what are the sicknesses of the heart. In doing so, I would like for us to first look at what are the hearts and how the scholars of Islam have categorized the varying types of hearts, and of them are three. The first of which is a healthy heart and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran The day on which neither wealth nor sons will be of any use except for those who bring to Allah a song heart And the scholars have defined this, it is a heart cleansed from any passion That challenges what Allah's commands and disputes what he forbids It is free from any impulses which he contradicts And it is free from any impulses which contradicts his good as a result, it is safeguarded against the worship of anything other than him and seeks the judgment of no one other than that of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Its services are exclusively reserved for Allah 
willingly and lovingly, with total reliance, relating all matters to him in fear, hope, and sincere dedication. And this is a heart that is healthy. A heart that is completely dedicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A heart who's, who is only seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A heart that is only relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and only Allah alone. This is a healthy heart. The opposite of that is a sick heart and this is a heart with life in it as well as illness. It sustains one for a moment and it loses one for a moment. Part of the heart yearns for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeks for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and part of the heart wants that which satisfies, satisfies its pleasures, that which calls away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a heart that is sick. This is a heart that is full of iman and want Allah, and a heart that is full of admiration of itself. This is a heart which is constantly in battle with itself. And this is a sick heart. And then there is a dead heart. The heart which is absolutely away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A heart that is drawn to destruction. A heart that is drawn to disobedience. A heart that is only on the path of satisfying its own pleasures. The things that it wants. Money, wealth, women, power, whatever it is. That's a dead heart that only seeks that. So the first heart is alive, submitted to Allah, humble, sensitive, and aware. The second heart wavers between what is safety and what is bad. And the last heart is brittle, and this is dead. And these are the three types of hearts that the scholars of Islam, they have categorized them into. So there are four sicknesses of the heart that we would like to look at today, and the causes of them. Before we can understand the sicknesses of the heart, we must look at that which causes the sickness of the heart. And the main, of, the main one is that which is temptation. Temptation to which a heart is exposed to give rise to desires and fantasies. Desires and fantasies which causes corruption and which causes our belief to falter. When we are filled with desires, desires that which are not According to the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the heart becomes wavering. And these desires lead to fantasies. And fantasies cause that even those who are educated, those who are knowledgeable, those who know, it makes them doubt their knowledge. So the first of that is temptation. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was reported to have said in a hadith, temptations are present are presented to the heart one by one. Any heart that accepts them will be left with a black stain, but any heart that rejects them will be left with a mark of purity. So the hearts are of two types, a dark heart that is turned away and become like an overturned vessel, and a pure heart that will never be harmed by temptation for as long as the earth and the heavens exist. The dark heart only recognizes, recognizes good and denounces evil when it suits its desires and whims. And this is the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to Imam Muslim. And this is very clear as day. A heart that rejects the temptations that come to it. And temptations comes in many, 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 many forms. What might be a temptation for one, might not be a temptation for another. What is one man's meat is another man's poison, as the saying goes. But a heart that succumbs to its temptation is a heart that becomes stained that becomes stained. And the more stained the heart becomes, the more corrupted the heart becomes. And when the heart becomes corrupted, it reaches to such a state that it only recognizes good and denounces evil only when it suits itself. Only when it suits itself. So we speak up for that which is good, and we denounce that which is evil only in the time that it is beneficial to us. And this is a dark heart. This is a heart that has been corrupted by temptation. On the other side is a heart that remains pure. That remains pure through steadfastness in keeping away from all that tempts it towards evil. So the scholars of Islam, after looking at the heart and understanding the sicknesses of the heart, they've categorized them into four 
And one scholar of Islam, Ibn Mubarak, Rahimahullah, he said, I've seen wrong actions killing hearts, and the degradation may lead them to becoming addicted to them. Turning away from wrong, wrong actions gives life to the heart, and opposing yourself is best for it. And this is the best statement. So the four poisons or the four sicknesses of the heart, we will go through them today and they're very short, inshallah. The first of which is unnecessary talking. The second of which is unnecessary or unrestrained glances. The third of it is too much food. And the last of it is keeping bad company. Of all the poisons, these are the most widespread and have the greatest effect on the heart's well-being. The first of which is unnecessary talking. According to Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, he reported the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the faith of a servant is not put right until his heart is put right. And his heart is not put right until his tongue is put right. This shows that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has made the purification of faith conditional on the purification of the heart. And the purification of the heart conditional on the purification of the tongue. In another hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was reported to have said, none of you, if any of you truly believes in Allah and the last day, he should either speak good or keep silent. He should either speak good or keep silent. On this matter, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he said, a person who talks too much is a person who often makes, makes mistakes. And someone who often makes mistakes often has wrong actions. The friar has a priority over such a frequent sinner. Again, Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, a person who talks too much makes, often makes mistakes. And a person who often makes mistakes often has wrong action. And the friar has given priority over them. He said, do not talk excessively without remembering Allah because such excessive talk without the mention of Allah causes the heart to harden. And the person furthest from Allah is a person with a hard heart. This is Umar ibn al-Khattab and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam enlightening us on the importance of protecting and purifying our tongue. A little care to how we use our tongue. We use our tongue in insulting people. We use our tongue in backbiting. We use our tongues in slandering. We use our tongue to ridicule. We use our tongue to lie. We use our tongue to deceive. We use our tongue to corrupt. My dear brothers and sisters, Abu, Bakr, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, he said, what will, be what will be the cause for most people to be sent to the fire of hell are the two openings. And what are they? The mouth and the private parts. Because sometimes it is so easy for our tongue, something light, something without difficulty for us to involve in. We don't take heed. We are not people that are conscious of what comes out of our mouth. We are not people that pay care to how we should use this important organ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. But we use it without care, we use it without concern, and we don't realize how much it has taken us into the fire of hell. For some people will be dragged by their tongues into the fire of hell, my dear brothers and sisters. And this is the first poison of the heart. As, Allah, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the first hadith I mentioned, the heart will not, the, our iman, our faith will not be set right until our heart is set right. And our heart will never be set right until our tongues are set right. The second of which is unrestrained glances. And if you realize what we are doing here, all of these, or most of these points have to do with just one part of our body, right? Unrestrained glances. The unrestrained glance results in the one who looks, who looks becoming attracted to what he sees and imprinting an image of what he sees in his heart. This can result in several kinds of corruption of the heart. It's been related that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, a glance is a poison arrow of shaitan. Whoever lowers his gaze for Allah, he will be bestow upon him a refreshing sweetness which we will find in his heart on the day when he meets him. Shaitan enters with a, glance, with a glance. We want to protect our heart, this place of emotions, this place of feelings, this place where Iman is supposed to reside, what is it? Our eyes. They said the eyes are the windows to the heart. 
An unrestrained glance, as the Prophet wasallam said, it's an arrow of shaitan. It enters into our eyes and causes us to start feeling, start feeling things which we're not supposed to be feeling. Start imprinting our mind images and fantasies, as I mentioned earlier, about temptation. Temptation comes from when we start looking at things and start wishing for them. Especially with the opposite gender, as this is one of the greatest sin in Islam, zina. Shaitan knows this. So he will call us, he will call us to this sin in so many ways, subhanAllah. The first of which is an unrestrained glance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, He said, do not obey anyone whose heart we made forgetful and remember us, who follows his own desires and who affairs exceeds all bounds. Because when we look at things that we're not supposed to be looking at, and this enters into our heart, and shaitan has a place now in our hearts. A place that will open, that he will open the doors of desires that we're supposed to be keeping under lock and keys, under control. And he causes our hearts to want things that we're not supposed to be venturing to. When we look in our society today, living in North America, we find one very, very serious problem in our society is divorce, which many times stem, stems from immorality and unfaithful partners. What causes that? What causes that our society today, that even though we are filled with so much knowledge, we are still so immoral? We have reached the heights of science and technology, and ignorance is something that is very, very at, in a distant past. Yet, we act like if we are animals. SubhanAllah, when we look at the Muslim society today, we treat immorality and immoral actions and illicit relationships as it is commonplace. When we are taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when they tell us their harms and the destruction that these cause, we might look for a fleeting second, but the effect on our heart is lasting. As one scholar put, he put, getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like climbing up a mountain. Purifying our heart is like climbing up a mountain. It takes a single slip for you to fall way down back and have to start that journey again. A single glance, my dear brothers and sisters. It is said that which is between the eye and the heart is an immediate connection. So when we look at things that we are not supposed to be looking at, this leads to the corrup corruption of the heart. Letting the gaze roam free cloaks the heart with darkness. Just as lowering the gaze for Allah closes it in light above. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned us in Surah An-Nur. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. The likeness of his light is as if it was a niche. And in that niche is a lamp. And that lamp is a glass. And, and, the, and the glass, it was a brilliant star lit from a blessed tree. An olive, neither of the east of the west, or the west, whose oil is well luminous, through fire never touched it. Light upon light, Allah guides whomsoever he wants to his light. And Allah strikes for man, and Allah knows all things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us the purity of the heart and the importance of light. What clouds that light, what cloaks that light is a corrupted heart. And a corrupted heart that stems, that stems from immorality, that stems from urges of fulfilling our desires and fantasies that are away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us in the Quran, He said, tell the believing men to lower their gaze and guard their modesty. That is more purifying for them. Surely Allah is aware of what they do. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to us, O you who believe, lower your gaze and guard your modesty. That is more purifying for us, my dear brothers and sisters. We should not be the people that looks everywhere that we go. Simple etiquette as a Muslim has such far-reaching effects on our heart and our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
as I said, the, wind, the eyes are the windows to their heart. Let us protect it. Let us be like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to walk on the road. He used to be so bent over, looking down, that he would be almost like he's falling over. That is the way of Rasulullah, with humility, with protection, protecting himself from all that is evil around us. The third sickness of the heart is too much food. The consumption of small amount of food guaranteed tenderness of the heart, strength of the intellect, humility of the self, weakness of desires, and the gentleness of temperament. Immoderate eating brings out the opposite of these praiseworthy characteristics. Again, the consumption of small amounts of food guarantees tenderness of the heart, the strength of intellect, humility of the self, the weakness of desires, and the gentleness of temperament. Excessive eating causes the opposite of that. Ibn al-Miqdam, he said, I heard him, uh, radiallahu anhu, he said, I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, the son of Adam feels no vessel more displeasing to Allah than his stomach. The son of Adam feels no vessel more displeasing to Allah than his stomach. A few morsels should be enough for him to preserve his strength. If he must fill it, then he should allow a third for his food, a third for his drink, and a third for empty, for ease of breathing. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reminding us, do not overeat, my dear brothers and sisters. Excessive eating induces many kinds of harm. It makes the body inclined towards its obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and makes worship and obedience seem laborious. Excessive eating makes us lazy, my dear brothers and sisters. And check it. How often have we eaten a full stomach? Do we want to get up and do anything else? When we eat a lot, we want to sleep a lot. And when we sleep a lot, we become lazy in our obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A full stomach, a full stomach and excessive eating have caused many wrong action and inhibited much worship. Whoever guards against the evil of overfilling his stomach has prevented greater evil. It is easier for shaitan to control a person who has a filled stomach with food and drink, which is why it is often said, restrict the pathways of shaitan by fasting. Restrict the pathways of shaitan by fasting. And what are the two pathways we have just reminded ourselves of? First, the eye to the heart. By fasting, the consciousness is there for us to safeguard our eyes because we want to protect our fast for it to be, uh, for it to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the major pathway is what? The pathway to the stomach. Fast and you protect these pathways by Allah, uh, from shaitan, subhan, uh, subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his infinite mercy has guided us to this. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions, they used to go hungry very frequently. Very often they would go hungry at the side of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would fast so much, so much, so much so that people would think he will never break his fast. And then sometimes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would go for such a long period of not fasting that people would think he will never fast. It is said that, it, that there was a tribe of Bani Israel. It was a group of young men from Bani Israel. And it was time for them to break their fast. And a young man from among them stood up and said, Do not eat too much, otherwise you will drink too much. And then you will end up sleeping too much. And then you will lose too much. He said, do not eat too much because then you will want to drink too much. And when you drink too much and you want to sleep too much, and then when we sleep too much, we end up losing too much. What do we lose, my dear brothers and sisters? What do we lose? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in explaining the pathway to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said to the companions, travel a portion of the morning and a portion of the evening. What does that mean? What does traveling in the morning and in the evening mean? It means standing up and spending our time in ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he advised the man that came to him and said he will never sleep. He said, pray like Dawood alayhi salam. Pray like Dawood alayhi salam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went on to describe the different portions of the night one should spend, uh, spend in praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the most virtuous time to spend in obedience, in, in, in qiyam, in salah, in worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when? is in the latter part of the night, my dear brothers and sisters. How will we be able to do that? 
when we go to bed with such a filled stomach we can't able to get up even for fajr in the morning subhanallah how are we going to make it to stand in tahajjud for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it was once said anyone who controls his stomach is in control of his deen and anyone who controls his hunger is in control of good behavior disobedience towards allah is nearest to a person who is satisfied who is satiated with a full stomach and farthest away from a person who is hungry disobedience to allah it is closest to a person who has a filled stomach and it is farthest away from a person who is hungry the last the last poison that i would like to remind ourselves about today is keeping bad company keeping bad company as the saying goes birds of one feather flocks together and this inshallah we hope to remind ourselves very quickly we find ourselves very constantly in unnecessary companionship and this has become so rampant it has become more like a chronic disease in our society very often we find ourselves falling into the company of the wrong set of people very often do we find ourselves allowing ourselves to be among those people who are constantly in the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who are constantly taking us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the kind of companionship that is depriving us of generosity and planting discord planting disunity in our hearts among ourselves the kind of people that will constantly lead us to backbiting and slandering that will constantly lead us away from the masjid but rather into the bars the kind of people that will lead us away from the sanctity of marriage but rather to, to indulge in that which is evil of zina my dear brothers and sisters we must be careful we must be careful of the people that we consider our friends and our company and the scholars of Islam they've categorized these types of people into four types our friends and our companies they've categorized them into four types the first of which are those whose company is like food it is dispensable day or night once a servant has taken his need of it he leaves it until he requires it and so forth these are the people with knowledge of Allah of his commands of the scheming of his enemies and the diseases of their heart and their remedies who wishes well for Allah and his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his servants associating with this type of people is an achievement of itself this is self-explanatory my dear brothers and sisters our companions our friends we utilize them for the good and at a time which is needed for us which is needed of us and when it is no longer needed we put it we put it off for another time we are not people that overindulge ourselves with our friends and our companies rather over because we understand that overindulgence will lead into boredom and boredom not, nothing good ever comes from boredom the second category are those people whose company is like a medicine they're only required when a disease set in when you are healthy you have no need for them however mixing with them is sometimes necessary for your livelihood businesses consultation and the like once you have when, when you what you need for them they should be avoided these are the people that might have bad character traits but they have some skills that which we might need in order to fulfill the daily aspects of our lives once we fulfill that need stay away they are not the people you should seek companionship in order to enlighten your faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the people that only fulfills a need and keep away from them. The third category are those people whose company is harmful. Mixing with this type of person is like a disease in all its variety and degrees. Not only in some aspect, but in all aspects. They are, they are a disease, they are a sickness to us. And there, are, and there are strengths and weaknesses that they continuously attack in us. Associating with one or some of them is like an incurable chronic disease. You will never need a prophet in this life, nor in the next. And these are the type of people we should be very, very, very careful of. And these are the type of people that sometimes can mask itself as something that which is good. These are the people whose speech doesn't benefit us now whose company help us to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they don't know themselves they don't know the state of their own souls how can we expect them to help us get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our bad company is something that sometimes we overlook tolerating people and understanding their weaknesses does not mean we should compromise our own deen for that tolerance is not compromise being kind to people does not mean we have to be like them 
Our neighbor, he might be a Muslim, but he involves in all that which is disobedient to Allah does not mean we can't be a good neighbor to him, nor does it mean that we have to shun him completely, nor does it mean that we have to indulge everything with him. Even our own siblings that might be involving in that which is haram, they might be a disbeliever, subhanAllah. It doesn't mean that we should shun them and cut them out of our lives, nor does it mean that we have to indulge in every single thing that they want to partake in. Where that line is drawn, we must keep it. We must protect the hudud of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can know someone for 20 years and 30 years. It doesn't mean that they become our best of friends. Because if they are not close with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they should not be people that are close to our hearts. We should not be people that forsake our believing brothers and our believing sisters for people who don't. We should not be people that forsake those who are closest to us in faith for those who aren't, my dear brothers and sisters. For the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, a person will not taste the sweetness of iman until three things, and one of those things is that they love or hate someone only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the last category of people that we have to be careful of these are the people who just being around them is doom in itself. It is like a poison. These are the people of religious innovations and misguidance. These are the people who abandon the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and people who advocate other beliefs. These are very, very dangerous because they're masqueraded as people of piety, people of deen, but that which they call, to, uh, call us to is away from the path of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is away from the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they call us to that which will take us into the fire of hell and it is masked by deen it is masked by belief and these are the most dangerous they call what is sunnah bir'ah and vice versa these are the people who consider that which is sunnah they call it bir'ah and that which is bir'ah they call it sunnah we must be very very careful and the only way we'll be aware of this is when we are people that seek knowledge of this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why the scholars have categorized this category as the most dangerous. Because it is the category most Muslims are most likely to fall into company of. Why? Because we don't find ourselves learned enough of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to recognize fahisha, to recognize misguidance, to recognize bir'ah, to recognize that which is away from the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the result of having such a company is the death of the heart, my dear brothers and sisters. My dear brothers and sisters, this is our reminder today. Let us be careful of our company. Let us be very, very careful of the people who we have around us. For the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he likened our friendship to two sets of people. Like a person who sells perfume and a person who is a blacksmith. If you spend your entire day in the shop of a person who sells perfume, then when you leave, your entire body will be smelling like perfume even though you had no handling with that. Isn't that so? But if we're in the shop of a blacksmith, whether we work or not, we step out smelling just like that. So having a company that which is good is like a perfume seller. It has a good impact on us. It urges to that which is good and we become purified by just being in their presence but having company that which is bad even though you do not do that which they do it contaminates and it affects the heart my dear brothers and sisters and let us remember these are our reminders today let us be people that are careful with our tongue let us guard our tongues let us protect our eyes from unrestrained glances let us not overeat overeating as we mentioned leads to so many sicknesses and i didn't even go into the medical harms of that and most, and fourth, and most very important is our companionship and our friendship. And these, my dear brothers and sisters, are the four poisons of the heart. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our hearts. I mean, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help, uh, help us to be among those who establishes that which is true. I mean, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from misguidance. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant in our hearts iman and taqwa and knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enlighten our hearts. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that which is evil within us and that which is with, uh, evil around us. I mean, I call you Holy Hada, was the for Allah, Hari Walakum, Wahiro Dawan, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen.
Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah Al-Karim Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Wa man ihtada bi ihsanin ila yawmiddin Allahumma salli ala Muhammad Wa ala ali Muhammad Kama sallayta ala Ibrahim Wa ala ali Ibrahim Innaka hamidun majid Allahumma barik ala Muhammad Wa ala ali Muhammad Kama barakta ala Ibrahim Wa ala ali Ibrahim Innaka hamidun majid اللهم إنا نسألك الهدى والتقى والعفاف والغنى اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من عذاب القبر وبالعذاب جهنم ومن فتنة المحيا وممات ومن شر فتنة المسيح الدجال اللهم إنا نسألك الهدى والتقى والعفاف والغنى اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا ورزقا طيبا وعملا متقبلا اللهم إنا نسألك الجنة ونعوذ نعوذ بك من النار اللهم إنا نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار اللهم إنا نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار اللهم عطنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم عز الإسلام المسلمين اللهم عز الإسلام المسلمين اللهم عز الإسلام المسلمين اللهم انصر الإسلام المسلمين والمجاهدين في كل مكان اللهم انصر الإسلام المسلمين في سوريا اللهم انصر الإسلام المسلمين في فلسطين اللهم انصر الإسلام المسلمين في يمن وفي أفغانستان وفي عراق وفي كل مكان عباد الله إن الله يأمركم بالعدل والإحسان وإتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكر الله يذكركم واستعينوا يستجب لكم ولذكر الله تعالى أكبر وأقيم الصلاة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر